Fold structures are dramatic, but how do rocks do it? After all, during deformation, they could have broken instead. Well, folding can develop a range of shapes and on a variety of scales. Can we explain these structures? Well, we're going to look at the difference between hinges and limbs. and We're going to spend quite a lot of time looking at the process of buckling. We'll look at buckling in single layers and on multi-layer sequences and on rocks with which are super layered, rather like a stack of paper. And then we'll just look briefly at two other processes by which rocks can fold, so-called forced folds and shear folds. Let's start off by looking at how an individual layer might actually fold. So the first mechanism we're going to look at is something called tangential longitudinal strain, where the bending can occur by outer arc extension and inner arc contraction with no distortion on the limbs. And you have an analogy of this in your own hands. It's a finger. If you bend your finger, the outer side of your knuckle stretches and the inside contracts like this. And it's a good job your fingers work like this. And you see these relationships in nature. So here's a recumbent fold structure, the hinges running into the hillside. And if we zoom in, we can pick out the outer arc stretching because of those white veins which have cracked the bedding. And then if we look at the inner arc, we can see that it's pinched in, implying layer contraction. But this isn't the only way in which rocks can accommodate folding. Another way is through flexural slip. And this time there's no slip at the hinge and all the action happens on the bedding planes. And an analogy of this is a paperback book. We can see that in order to accommodate the fold, the layers have slipped. And so this behaviour is something you'd expect to see in well-layered rocks, such as here in the Canadian Cordillera, where these interbedded limestones are believed to have deformed by interbed slip. So there's a derivation of flexural slip, which is called flexural flow. So rather than view the rock as made as lots of individual bedding planes, it's viewed as a continuous medium. Nevertheless, we can still mimic this behaviour and the shear sense using our paperback book. So on here we've drawn some lines that are more or less orthogonal to layering. And after folding, this is what happens. So you can see that there's no shear at the hinge and the limbs themselves have sheared inwards like this. So we've got three mechanisms by which the layering can deform to create a fold. Now let's take that forward and look at buckle folding. Buckling is formed by layer parallel contraction as you can see on the cartoon. So our understanding of buckling was developed in, in the 1960s by two geologists, Bayer and Ramberg, who independently carried out some experiments using analog materials like plasticine and they could control the viscosity of the material. So in this, the viscosity mu is set up with a higher viscosity than the medium within which it is embedded, which is the yellow material in the view. And after deformation, you make folds in the stiffer, higher viscosity layer. These experimenters were able to change the layer thickness and the viscosity and empirically derive this relationship, that the wavelength of the fold relates to layer thickness and the viscosity contrast. It's a rather ugly expression, but the take home is that layer thickness and viscosity contrast control the behavior and the development of wavelength. And we can see this empirically on this rather nice deformed aplite vein in the Swiss Alps, where the layer thickness varies from left to right in the view, and so too does the wavelength of the folds. Thick layer long wavelength, thin layer short wavelength. So this is a qualitative demonstration of the Biot-Ramberg relationship. Now their experiments also go on to explain some various other phenomena. One of these is the evolution of parasitic folds. Parasitic folds, little folds, sitting on the backs of big ones, as seen in this photograph. Well, in this explanation, we're starting off with a single high viscosity layer in green, embedded in low viscosity material yellow. And after a fairly large amount of deformation, we make a fold train. 
The effect of this is to create a new mechanical thickness for this package. So the wavelength increases. Consequently, the early form folds are folded by the subsequent development of the structure. Creating structures like this, little folds refolded on a longer wavelength. OK, so that's the behaviour of a single layer. But rocks aren't generally made of single layers, they're made of many layers. So we have to adapt things if we want to understand how folds develop in these situations. So let's go back to our experiments again. And we've still got our two viscosities, mu1 higher than mu2. So we have two layers of higher viscosity, one is thicker than the other. And what the experiments show is that the thin layer buckles quite soon during the experiments, but during the early parts of the, ex of the same experiments, the thick layer continues to thicken before it folds. So there's a delay between the onset of buckling in the thin layer compared with that in the thick layer. Later, as the thick layer begins to catch up and fold, it folds on a longer wavelength than the little folds, and so these little folds are again folded by the big ones. It's another explanation for making parasitic folds. Here's an example of quartzofelspathic rocks with different layer thicknesses. If we pick out the layering, you can see that the thin layer picked out in yellow is deforming on a shorter wavelength in general than the thicker layer which is picked out in green. The little folds are folded by the longer wavelength structures. So we have another mechanism by which we can form parasitic folds. But all our experiments so far have considered the situation where the layer we're worried about has got a higher viscosity than the matrix within which it's embedded. But what happens if we reverse that situation and our green layer has a lower viscosity than the matrix? Well, it generates these structures, mullions. If we zoom in on that, we'd have a pinched in fold structure and a more bulbous fold structure. The bulbous structures are cored by the high viscosity material and the pinched in bits by the low viscosity. This type of behaviour is clearly seen in interfaces. So here's an interface between some sand and some siltstone and you can see that the fold interface has got these pinched in geometries and we can therefore deduce for the time of deformation the relative viscosity between these two materials. Here's another example, this time between a pegmatite and sheared gneisses, so radically different material, but they still show a viscosity contrast between each other. And we can see that from the pinched in behaviours and the bulbous shapes. Again, the bulbous cores are cored by the high viscosity material. The lower viscosity material is in the pinches. So the pegmatite in this deformation had a higher viscosity than the surrounding gneisses. Let's move on now. So let's consider rocks now, which have got a fine layering, which provides an anisotropy. In this case, it's provided by well-pronounced bedding. Well, the folds these develop are kinky. Very sharp hinges, very straight limbs. And here's an example from southwest England showing those forms. We just bring out these very sharp hinges in the cliff section for these recumbent folds. And presumably, the deformation here is accommodated by flexural slip in these rocks with this super layering. So different layer properties generate different types of folds. And we can use these structures then to deduce the relative mechanical properties of rocks, at least qualitatively, during deformation. Let's now look at how an individual fold might develop. And again, this understanding was developed largely through analog experiments in the late 1960s and early 1970s. And what these experiments did was to look at how much effort it took to deform a package of rocks through time. In other words, they were tracking the strength of the material as the deformation progressed. So early on, the strength rap increases as bending is resisted by the layers. It takes more and more effort to keep pushing in. But when 
the rock begins to fold. It moves to a pin joint limb rotation mechanism. So at this stage, the deformation can progress very easily by rotation of the limbs. So the strength drops. But through time, it gradually increases as the folds tighten to lock up. But in nature, often the deformation doesn't end there. The limbs break. So you have slip in the hinge areas, which allows deformation and limb rotation to progress a little bit further. So this is the cyclic evolution for an individual stack of folds. We can see the product of this in structures like this. So if we look very carefully into the core of this antiform, you can see that the hinge has failed by a little fault structure. It's a faulted fold hinge. OK, so that's a, a brief introduction to buckle folds and their evolution. We've looked at them in single layers, in multi layers, and in these super layered successions where there's a pronounced layer anisotropy. But it's not the only way in which folding can develop. Another set of folds are called forced. By that it means that folding is a consequence of another non-buckling process. And here's an example of a fold that is created as a consequence of movement on a fault that has a particular shape. It's following a little staircase. Just to cartoon up how that works, this is the evolution of the structure. So the fault forms as this step and movement of the hanging wall block up the step has created a fold in the hanging wall, not through buckling, but because of a consequence of displacement up the fault shape. It's a forced fold. Here's another example of folding, in this case by salt doming, seen in outcrop here in part of Pakistan. The red material is the salt. Let's pick out some of the geology. There's the layering in the sandstones that overlie the salt. And the salt has been mobile and is moving upwards. As a consequence, it is folding the rocks on top. It's another example of forced folding. Another way in which layers can become fold is by becoming entrained into zones of shearing. Let's see how that works. So here we have a layer and these two blocks are going to move past each other like this, creating a shear zone into which our green layer has become entrained and as a consequence it is folded. We can see a natural example in the photograph. We trace the layering around. It's deflected in to a shear zone with this sense of displacement. Folding as a consequence of shearing entrainment into the shear zone. The geometry of these structures are characterised by the formation of similar folds. So we've explored how layers can fold contrasting deformation between hinges and limbs, and we spent a bit of time looking at buckling, buckling in single layers, in multi layers, and in super layered successions. We've also seen that folding can occur not simply as a consequence of buckling, but also by other processes, forced folds and shear folds. These behaviours betray the mechanical properties of the rocks during the deformation. They tell us something about the conditions of the deformation and we can also deduce the kinematic, all important in deducing tectonic evolution for a region.